Hi, I'm James Fortier, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. For today's show, I'm joined by Chris Lepchek, who's a professor in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences at Auburn University. He's here to talk to us today about the ecological role of urban green spaces, how they're connected, and how they contribute to biodiversity and ecosystem function. It's an area that's gaining a lot of attention with the advent of green architecture and urban planning, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions, and we try to tease out some of those today. Let's get straight to the interview. Dr. Lepchek, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk with you. All right, so just to get started, you know, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what you mean in your article by urban green spaces. You know, what kind of areas are we talking about and what kind of growth are we seeing and discussing? Sure, that, that's a great question. Um, urban green spaces, are, you know, and to many people are mean different things. And if we were to go and look in the ecological literature or urban planning literature, it, it's really all over the place. And, and that was one of the reasons that we really thought there was a need to have a discussion on, on what is an urban green space. And, and for us, and, and looking through what different scientists and managers have been involved with, um, it really means a lot of things to different individuals. And, and we took that together to, to create essentially a continuum of kinds of um, spaces within cities that can be undisturbed and natural, looking almost like a pristine environment, if you will, through lawns, um, through uh, brownfield sites. Um, you know, it could be an industrial park. So essentially we're talking about an area that, that has not been paved over and uh, it has vegetation on it that and the vegetation and um, animals could be native species or non-native that isn't important in the definition so um, what we find is that we have a range that covers highly man-made uh, types of green spaces like urban um, rooftop uh, green gardens or rooftop gardens all the way through remnant little patches of what existed prior to a city being established. Okay. And just so people kind of have a baseline understanding, you know, where would a, a green space like say Central Park fit on that continuum? Yeah. So a green space, it would fall in a modified um, version of what we would consider maybe a natural area. So it has elements that are um, similar to the surrounding landscape and that it does have plants and animals that are native. But it's highly modified in that it's manicured, so it's it's similar to resembling a backyard where people mow and they trim trees um, and they plant certain desirable species. Uh, there are trails and concrete structures. So it would fall somewhere kind of in the middle of um, having attributes that resemble um, a wild area as well as those resembling a backyard or pretty modified area. And so parks like uh, Central Park are great examples of a place that could fall right in the middle. Okay, and you've hinted a little bit about this uh, by talking about the species that, you know, inhabit these spaces. Um, but what's their ecological importance, you know, kind of very broadly speaking? Uh, you know, do they harbor a lot of native species or non-native species? Um, you know, kind of what role do they play in the, in the broader landscape? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point because um, surprisingly a lot of people have not worked on really doing good inventories of urban green spaces and because of the way they can be so broadly defined, they can be entirely comprised of species non-native to that location through harboring a very large number or majority of native species. And, you know, one... Probably the one element we do know is that generally cities harbor less biodiversity than the broader region that surrounds them. Um, but whether those species are native or non-native is really contingent on what kind of green space, how old um, the area is, how it's being managed. So, you know, we can go into some wonderful green spaces and find um, native birds, native mammals, native plants. Um, a lot of uh, ecological function that we would expect to see um, in an intact system. But by the same token, there's many green spaces that we can find that have a lot of non-native organisms like uh, grasses and shrubs, um, introduced birds, introduced mammals, introduced insects. Um, 
And, you know, the, because urban ecology has not been as big a focus until really the last 20 years, it, it really had a resurgence. We just haven't done as good a job of, of inventorying some of these areas as we would like. And uh, so there, it's, it's really an open-ended kind of topic in terms of what lies out there and what we can hope to do. So, you know, if you were to uh, want to get a better inventory of what's out there, what would be the way to do that? Would it just be, you know, uh, sending a bunch of researchers out uh, in various fields to look at what species are present or, or are there other factors that would be looked at? Well, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of a great way to do it would be things like citizen science approaches or, or bio blitzes. Um, it really hits upon something that we probably just underrepresent the importance for in ecology and, and natural science as a whole, and, and that's monitoring. We we really have a poor understanding of of how many and where uh, in the world species are located relative to what we should and would like to, which which makes a lot of decisions hard. But in the case of these urban green spaces. They're really ripe opportunities to get classrooms, to get scientists all going out to a place to assess the biodiversity of a location. Um, in fact, we do this here at Auburn. We've had bio blitzes within uh, a nature preserve that we bring everybody together um, and try to inventory the species present. Central Park has had bio blitzes the same way. Okay, and uh, and if I can just get you to tell us a little bit more about what a bio blitz is, you know, I think most of our listeners will be familiar from my harping on it, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the, the concept of citizen science. Uh, but what's a bio blitz in particular? Sure, a bio blitz generally operates over a short amount of time, a day or two, and it brings scientists together with uh, the public, trying to identify all the species they can across taxa within a given location. So if we were to go to Central Park again. It would be the situation where we would have the public join in and they would go out with uh, scientists um, and work to try to identify, collect and identify the plants and the animals they see. Um, and really, it's, it's limited only by how much time and people you have. Uh, if you have people that are interested in studying herpetology and you can get the folks looking at the amphibians, the reptiles, um, you can do wonderful inventories of all the taxa. Same with insects. Um, we, when I've been involved in bio blitzes, it's really limited mainly by how many people you can get involved. If you can get a lot of scientists and a lot of the public, you can do a full inventory um, of a site within, you know, eight or 12 hours or a day. Um, but it's a wonderful way to bring together the public and the scientific community to simply look at what is present in a location. Okay. And do you tend to do those in sort of the, the blitz format rather than the ongoing monitoring for sort of human logistical reasons? Like it's easier to get everyone together to, you know, go out all at once than it would be to, um, you know, sustain an effort over months or years? Yeah, I think that logistically um, there's a lot of value in trying to do it at one time and, and getting a large number of participants engaged as well as um, being able to see what is happening at one point in time. Uh, for many species. Monitoring uh, ideally works well when you do it multiple times um, across time in a way that you can really start to see how things change. But one challenge of just straight monitoring is if you have fewer people doing it and fewer experts, you may not be able to assess all taxa at, in the same way that a bio blitz does. Okay. And, uh, you know, this next question may not have a ready answer yet, but I'm curious. Does this have the potential to be largely sort of an academic consideration? You know, when we look at the biodiversity in an urban setting, in an urban green space, does that biodiversity support biodiversity on the broader landscape? Or is it, you know, kind of isolated and on its own and just sort of a relic population that is really interesting for the people who live there, but doesn't contribute necessarily to the wider ecosystem? Or does it? Well, I mean, that, that's actually exactly some of the questions we need to know more about. We do know that uh, urban green spaces serve as uh, stopover or refueling sites for migratory birds. Uh, we know that they uh, do serve as habitat patches for species that um, can disperse across the landscape. But whether or not a, a given location would be a place that operates like a sink where we're pouring species from the outside in and are individuals of a population in and, and they're not really going
going to sustain a population in that green space is still fairly unknown for a lot of species. Um, and the importance of that is that as we continue building our cities out and urbanization increases, the green space present in a city actually has great importance of potentially mitigating against regional effects on populations. It also adds to um, the fact that, you know, if you have no green space in a, in a city, what happens to species that either need to move through or use that habitat? Are they simply displaced? Um, is there no habitat left? Is there no way to connect across? Um, so I think that realistically urban green spaces, we know they serve important functions for biodiversity. We know they contribute to species in the region, but on a species by species basis, especially once we start moving outside of either some better known um, wildlife species or plant species, we don't have as good of an understanding. So I think, again, you know, it's just, it's an area that may seem like it should be an obvious place we would look, but um, urban ecology, especially in the United States and Canada, has just not been a huge focus until really the um, 21st century. All right. So it could be the case that, you know, there's a large migratory bird species that uses an urban green space as a stopover. And we know about that one because it's a big flock of birds and we see it. Uh, whereas there might be some small, less charismatic lizard species um, that we don't know about because it's not as obvious to the eye. That's exactly correct. Um, do we have any sense now of, you know, kind of what level and type of connectivity matters? You know, is there any, has anyone done any work to evaluate, uh, you know, how far apart green spaces can be from one another before it impedes mo uh, movement of species or, or anything along those lines? Or is that still yet to be done? Well, you know, that really hits upon kind of how, how green spaces overlap a broader landscape ecology framework in that understanding interpatch distances for um, mobile species, plants or animals, very important. And w we have done that for species in agroecosystem settings, in forest uh, settings, but there's there hasn't been near as much done in terms of how far apart urban patch, urban green space patches are apart from one another. Um, and certainly not for the majority of species. So, you, you know, we it, we may work on several birds it, within a study and look at interpatch distance of the green spaces in a given city, but that hasn't been done for a large number of animals to date, and uh, less so, I think, on plants. That's an interesting, uh, you know, sort of deficit because, you know, I, I think back in bioscience, you know, the numerous studies that we've published on the effects of say, a border wall or even a roadway, intermittent flooding, uh, you know, and how that affects uh, species movement. But it hasn't really occurred as much, the research, in terms of, um, of interpatch movement. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think there's several reasons. I mean, I think we are gaining now better tools to actually do that. So there's been, you know, a large uptick in our ability to do conservation genetics and look at um, flow or, or movement from a genetic perspective, uh, the ability to actually tag animals with geolocators um, or GPS collars and the size which now we can put those on smaller and smaller animals, all of those tools are allowing us to actually understand movement of animals in fundamental ways that we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago. So um, I, I think it's not that we haven't thought about it as much as there's limitations in um, some of the technology or some cost limitation, but um, I, I actually am very kind of hopeful that all of these new advances really provide the opportunity now for us to ask and answer questions about movement within not just wildlands or forested systems or you know places that uh, a lot of us love to be in, but also within cities. So one thing I'm, I'm I'm wondering about is has there been any research uh, as of yet on you know kind of what features of green space um, make them more biodiverse you know ob obviously a you know paved over um, area with a few tree plantings is going to probably uh, house fewer species than largely unperturbed area but are there any other characteristics that represent commonalities in terms of um, biodiversity? 
There have been. Uh, one of the issues that comes up with that question is that it's varied across areas they've looked at so far. So we know that there are some locations that are quite biodiverse that are in wealthier neighborhoods. And so we come up with relationships that find correlations between biodiversity and household wealth. Um, we sometimes find it with the age of a neighborhood. Um, so, you know, an older neighborhood may have older trees and house more unique species. Uh, a couple situations that arise from that, are, are we talking about native species? Are we talking about non-native? Is it, is it the overall unique species richness we're finding? Um, so, you know, that, that's one issue. Are we measuring the same thing? Um, but when we go to look even at the same thing, we don't always find the same pattern from city to city. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. These, we, our cities are located in vastly different ecoregions around the world. Um, so, you know, the local uh, environmental conditions can differ greatly. And there's a big social component. So we know that in some parts of cities, there are people that spend a lot of effort to, um, in in terms of manipulating or managing property that can encourage for the betterment of that property, things like biodiversity. Um, so, you know, even my own work, we find that there are people that invest a lot in terms of managing their property for the benefit of birds, and they have high bird diversity because they're putting bird feeders out, they're putting bird houses out, um, they're planting vegetation that is bird friendly. and. So, you know, trying to lump all these things together has made kind of a unifying idea within urban ecology difficult um, because we just see different factors explaining why some places are biodiverse relative to others. So in, in reality, you just have to, you know, kind of uh, be very empirical about it and look at everything on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, and it ends up being, that's kind of this grand challenge of ecology of we would love not to be site-by-site um, and have some general rules, but but a lot of explanations are based on in a specific context. Okay, so yeah, so that would probably make uh, the creation of recommendations for um, you know various land planners more difficult. Yeah, that, that's true. I think um, making making any kind of management rec uh, recommendations often require um, specifics to a location that go far beyond what we can just state generally. I mean, we do know some general aspects that certainly are beneficial for green spaces, but a, a green roof is very different than a person's backyard in terms of the actual specific elements you need to tell a policymaker or a manager. Okay, and I, you know, I, I hope we can get back into that in a few minutes. But there was one thing I wanted to catch that you mentioned earlier, um, and I found very interesting in the article. But I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about ecological traps um, or population sinks. What are those, and in, in terms of urban green spaces? Right. Well, th there is a nuance in those terms, and, and I don't know that we need to go to the detail of the of the exact difference so much as we have locations in cities that they look like they should be um, qual high quality habitat where they are good habitat or locations where we find an organism. Um, and the reality is ultimately it's not beneficial for their population dynamics because that given location would not be able to support the population in the long term. So uh, we, we could think of a bird species, for instance, using um, a green space patch and it occupies that patch every year um, but it's not self-supporting within that patch, so there's not enough reproduction to meet a continued population without input from an outside source. Um, and, and so it causes that situation. It, the, the nuance to describe the difference between um, a trap and a sink really comes down to understanding things like habitat quality and aspects about the species um, that you're looking at relative to other patches. But at the end of the day, we could think of something like um, a small perching bird, let's say a, um, an American robin. Is it living in a habitat patch? And you see it year after year after year, but that patch really doesn't have the resources or the uh, or it being enough large enough size that allows that species to actually reproduce at a rate 
that year after year it could replenish itself with outside without importing individuals from the outside. So this could be a case in which you know the the patch has some sort of characteristics, uh, visually or otherwise, that make it somewhat appealing to some individuals of the species. But when they actually go there um, and and stop over there or stay there, there's not enough food resources or a large enough population to support population growth or sustainment. And, uh, and it does pose a bit of a conservation challenge in that you still have something of a habitat and you still have individuals there. So it's not meaningless. It's just that it may not be the level that uh, contributes to the overall population that uh, would be beneficial. And, you know, what would an example of that be? Is, is, it, is it possible to draw any sort of uh, generalities, you know, on the urban landscape? Or are they just, you know, of many, many types? Well, well I think we know that for many species, the, the, simply the size patch you have is a big um, contributor to success of many different measures of a species. So, you know, if we're talking about a very small patch, you know, on the order of a half hectare or hectare, you know, or, or something like a, an acre of a backyard, and, that, and that's the only forested area, you know, within a half kilometer or a kilometer, are species going to be successful in that patch um, in terms of producing a surplus or maintaining their population size? You know, realistically, that's so small that it wouldn't, it wouldn't factor in at all, and it would be, you know, one of these sinks. Um, and, and so, you know, the cutoff of what pop, of what, of how big an area is um, really depends upon the species. But we know in a lot of forested landscape ecology studies for birds that the patch size does matter for whether it's going to be a source or a sink. And then you get into other factors that relate to that habitat. So is there enough core area inside? Does it have the um, food resources either within that patch or nearby? Um, so we, we have some general guidelines uh, from landscape ecology and foraging ecology that really give us some idea that, that there are thresholds. Um, but, you know, the problem gets to that we haven't looked at a lot of species in detail to answer this question. I mean, there are some very good ones in terms of some birds of prey and some passerine studies but more could be done. So it's a case, you know, in which if you were trying to manage for greater biodiversity, you would try to manage toward those thresholds, um, but they're not yet known for enough species for, uh, you know, that to give a kind of complete and holistic picture to policymakers, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, this is where you get into that situation, you know, more can be better, but, but how much more, um, and, and given that land certainly does cost money and there's multiple demands for what, property gets used as in a city, you know, that's a, that's an important trade-off to understand. I mean, you can't make an infinitely large amount of green space in a city. So, um, but providing policymakers with some more definitive guidelines is certainly what we hope this work will, will push other researchers towards. And, and that kind of raises the question then of, you know, what's next for your research? Are, are you looking at any species or areas or patterns in particular? Yeah, uh, well, the, the authors on this study are part of um, a big comparative ecology of uh, green or of cities uh, project that we've been involved with for a number of years now. That um, started out with some interest looking at w what were commonalities and uh, in terms of biodiversity across cities of the world, and it really has expanded to understanding how biodiversity works in the city, um, how cities may be filtering species. Um, are cities unique in terms of their evolutionary distinctness with the species compositions? Uh, and so we're kind of, we've gotten, I think, to a place now where we're really starting to dig into the questions such as those posed here of the value of green space. And so we've been part of a net, uh, of building a urban uh, biodiversity network. So we have, um, a large project called Urbionet that is dedicated towards having researchers contribute data sets uh, to build a network that can ask ecological questions uh, about cities from around the world. And our goal is really to help in the end advance 
both basic science, but provide um, policymakers and managers and planners information they need to make better decisions um, from what we're collecting around the world. So if this is hopefully within the green spaces, you know, will kind of be the tip of the iceberg of where we're moving next in terms of understanding um, what we can hopefully contribute in the biodiversity information to, to see if there's, you know, not just patterns, but can we start to really understand more details. And, and several of the scientists on this paper have started specifically looking at some of those questions like urban green roofs. And we'll look forward to hearing more about that research in the coming months and years. Dr. Lefchik, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.